Last Sunday, we started a beautiful series of four facets of Jesus. We heard four facets, four features, four characteristics, four beautiful faces that the Lord brought it out in the Gospels. We saw what, what, what God wanted us to show the work of Jesus is here on earth. There are many facets, many carrots, many uh, angles, many ways to look at Jesus, but God has given us only four of them, which itself is too much for us to understand, to comprehend, to ponder, to meditate. What a good God we serve. The revelation comes to Ezekiel. In the book of Ezekiel, you can show them the first verse for today. In the fifth year, on the fifth day, Ezekiel gets the revelation in Jehoiim's captivity. It is so specific, fifth day and fifth year, it says, there are no accidents. It was coincidence, God incidents, God planned incidents. Five is a number of grace. So God was revealing grace to Ezekiel. God was revealing a person to Ezekiel. He gave him the vision of these four faces. I'll be getting into a quick recap and then we will move on. So let's see verse number 10. Drop down. Yeah. As for the likeness of their faces, each had the face of a man, each of the four had the face of a lion on the right side, each of the four had the face of an ox on the left side, and each of the four had the face of an eagle. So he saw a vision where this living creature did not look anything like on the earth. It was so different. This creature had all the four faces. It was a one living creature having six wings, two covering the face, two covering the body, two covering the feet, the face of a lion, face of an eagle, face of son of man, and face of a bull. All the four faces in the living creature that Ezekiel saw the vision. The same vision is seen by John on the island of Patmos. So John sees this vision. Now he sees these four living creatures are revolving around the throne and they tell John, come and see. Come. So they call John to come closer. When John is looking from far, when Ezekiel saw from far, he did not understand what are these living creatures that God is trying to talk. That's why you must come closer to God. Come closer to his word. Keep on hearing him. When you come closer, it becomes clearer. So now for new covenant, forgiven generation, for you and for I, for me, the message has become clearer. We are able to see those four faces in the gospels. Amen. So in the when the gospel writers wrote, we must understand beyond what is there in black and white. We must understand beyond Hebrew and Greek because there is first level of understanding which is only vocabulary and grammar. The second level of understanding of the scripture is it is giving you a story which any common man relates, any simple story that he understands. The third level of understanding is scripture is trying to connect from one scripture to the other scripture, Old Testament to the New Testament, or from chapter 1 to chapter 3, chapter 10, it is connecting scriptures, interpreting scriptures. That is third level of understanding. Now, the fourth level of understanding scriptures are deep inside. They are mysteries. It is beyond your reading, beyond your seeing. It is hidden. It was hidden for you, but it was not hidden from you. 
So these scriptures, these mysteries are revealed by Holy Spirit. There is no direct scripture that says the face of a lion. But the hidden scriptures, when you correlate, when you see the painting of the artist which began in Genesis, ends in Revelation. Now when you put the pieces of the puzzle together, what the viewer is able to see, the bigger picture is what you are able to see. Amen. When you come closer to see his word. So we saw that the gospel writers brought these four faces which were mentioned in the Old Testament. Matthew brought the face of the lion, the face of the leader of the wild animals, the face of the lion which is the one from the tribe of Judah. Amen. The book of Matthew starts off with the genealogy of Jesus going to a monarch, going to King David, going to Abraham, tracing the lineage to give you and me the information that he is the king of Jews. Matthew was a tax collector. He writes the details for the Jewish audience to know that he was the king of Jews, the promised Messiah in Amos, the promised Messiah of Isaiah and Micah. So he keeps quoting them throughout the book of Matthew. We see he always mentions he comes from town of Bethlehem. He he comes from Judah. He goes here to do the census. He does this. He is the one promised coming on the donkey's cult. So the mention of kingdom is there. Throughout the book of Matthew, we see, seek ye for the kingdom of God, it says, because he is the king of Jews. He is bringing the face of king of Jews, the lion. So there is mention of the kingdom in the book of Matthew. It is not the temporary kingdom as the world, as what we see. It is eternal kingdom. It is the kingdom of dear son. So Matthew refers to how there was a promise in Isaiah that a virgin shall give birth. Matthew says in 123 that a virgin shall give birth and you shall call him Emmanuel, God. God with us. How Matthew begins, there is a pattern, hidden message in the book of Matthew. When we come to the close of Matthew, we see the promise is fulfilled. He is not only with us, he is in us. He said in Matthew chapter 28, the last chapter of the book, I will be with you. That's the last verse. I will be with you until the end of the age. Amen. He's a promise-keeping God. He is with us. He is in us until the end of the age. Matthew brought the face of a lion, the triumphant king, the king who was not born in, born in a palace, but born in a manger, the king who was not wanting to enjoy the luxuries, the delicacies, all the beautiful, spacious rooms of a palace which he deserves. No place on earth can be a match to what he had in heaven. Yet, he left his glory. He left his mansion. He left his position. He was limited to a baby. He was limited to be a human. The suffering of Jesus did not start on the route of Gethsemane to Golgotha. The suffering of Jesus actually began when he became a fetus in the womb of Mary. How precious is that? How can the God of the universe, where heavens of the heavens cannot contain him, yet the womb of Mary contained him? He became a servant. He became limited. That's the face Mark brings out. Mark shows Jesus as a suffering savior, a bull who's tirelessly working from the time of conception until his crucifixion on the cross of Calvary. He was willing to be limited in the womb. He was willing to be limited in a human body. 
he was willing to be limited a body made out of dust which is such a humiliation for god eternal how much he loved us mark brings out the face of a suffering savior immediately is a often word used there because he is working working tirelessly busy busy going from one place to other comforting healing resurrecting going from one city to other city preaching in parables teaching he kept moving because he was doing the redemption work for the father so the book of matthew shows out how a bull is tirelessly working it brings out the story of exodus chapter 21 where we see how a slave is working for the master with no free will jesus we see he crushed his free will god gave him free will it was free will given to jesus just like how god has given to you and me it was voluntarily decision made by jesus jesus said voluntarily i choose to be a slave i choose to be a servant i will go pierce myself on the door post on the outskirts of jerusalem so that i can serve my bride i can serve my father because i love you dearly amen what a good god we serve what a good god we serve thank you jesus as the book of mark says that he is working tirelessly there is a pattern in the book of mark it ends mark mark chapter 16 the last chapter and the last verse it ends by saying and the lord working miracles among them confirming the word so he is working even today on the right hand side of the father forever he is wearing a girdle of a servant not around the waist but around his bosom because of his bond of love for you he is wearing the girdle working for you working for you to receive your healing what do i mean he has finished the work now the part that is left is for you and for me to receive yet he is the author and finisher of our faith he is helping you he is working in and through you so that you can partner with him and he has a great quality to give you the credit and you receive all what he has done amen the lord working in and through you even to this day on the right hand side of the father then we see the book of luke where he brings out the face of man why the face of man man is the leader among all the living beings he is created by the image of god he has psychology he has more emotions than animals he has sixth sense the way man thinks no animal can think and why god brought man because man failed man had strength in flesh man disobeyed god gave him free will he took free will and he disobeyed god and he ate the fruit jesus as a man obeyed god from the from the womb of mary until the cross of calvary there was perfect complete obedience flawless obedience the 613 laws that were given by moses were not maintained ever by any human being but one man on our behalf one man who went forward representing the entire human race our lord jesus christ fulfilled all the laws kept all the ordinances obeyed everything that required by the father because he represents you today you stand behind him as his younger brother and receive everything right rightfully belongs to him amen the son of man why son of man look brought forward the son of man for you to know that when you go through your weaknesses when you go through your difficulties when you go through temptations when you realize i am weak i have tried 
everything, but I have failed. I realize I am physically limited. I realize I am emotionally limited. I realize I am financially limited. I realize I am psychologically limited. But I rely on the unlimited Jesus, Holy Spirit, which is given to you and to me now. Amen. So when you realize that, when you see the book of Luke, you realize, you see, he is the one Hebrews 4.15 talks about. The high priest who was tempted in every way, yet without sin. The high priest who knows our weaknesses. Today the Bible says, God understands your weaknesses. He knows when you're waiting, how much you are in despair. He knows how it is to be hungry. He knows what it is to be tired. He knows what it is to be rejected. He knows what it is to be betrayed. He knows what it is to be left alone. He knows what it is when everyone is humiliating, talking bad things, accusing false allegations. He knows when people gossip. He understands everything. The high priest on the right hand side of the father, the son of man, because he took your place. Amen. Because he took your place. He took as a man all the sickness, all diseases, whatever pain you're going through in your body, Jesus understands. We are not having a high priest who cannot understand. He became son of man so that he can understand. He knows he does not have to become son of man for him to understand. He understands us as God but he became son of man for you to relate that he understands. Amen? Amen? So now you know that Jesus became man. So he knows everything. You don't have to fake with him. You don't have to wear a mask in prayer. You don't have to hide something to talk. You can say everything what is on your mind. You can say, God, these are my weaknesses. These are my shortcomings. There's nothing that I have to hide from you. Anyways, you know everything. I only submit, surrender, and humble myself. That with your strength, I can do all things. Amen? Paul said, I can do all things. Why? Because he saw his shortcomings as a man. That is why gospel is to be preached not by a man or a woman. There, there has to be no controversy on this. Anyways, it is not the man or a woman. It is not about gender. It is all about Jesus. Christ in you is the one talking through you. You must have the consciousness of that. You should not be conscious of your gender. You should be conscious of Christ in you. Amen. So he is the son of man. The, uh, the beauty of son of man was brought forward by the book of Luke. In the book of Luke. The, the book of Luke starts off with a, high, uh, with a priest, Zechariah. And it ends with our high priest. So book of Luke says the priest was dumb. And our priest is always lifting hands. Luke 150. Lifting hands and is always blessing you. Can you see the hidden message in the book of Luke? There is a pattern of son of man. Now let's go to the book of John. The book of John has such a beautiful hidden message of eagle. It starts off with in the beginning was the word. The word was with God and the word is God. The book of John has no genealogy because he is God. He is self-existent. He does not need a record from where he came. It just starts off like how it starts. In the beginning, God, God created heavens and the earth. There's no introduction over there. It starts off with no introduction about a person, about a El Shaddai, about a spirit called God. But then as we continue from Genesis to Revelation, we see the beautiful portrait unveiled. Amen. Amen. The beautiful portrait gets unveiled scripture by scripture. 
painters will know what I'm talking about. Scripture by scripture, they are painting. The, the Holy Spirit is painting. So we get to see to some extent, even now, not clearly. <laughs> Amen? So the book of John brings out eagle. Wow. It brings the face of an eagle. Why? Eagle has a sharp vision and eagle is the leader among the uh, birds and eagle always kills, prays the snake. Amen. <laughs> so Jesus came to destroy the snake. Amen. So eagle prays on snake. Eagle's eyes are so sharp. No matter how high it is flying, it is able to slay deep down the snake and capture. Are you able to relate? If there is any snake in your life, color, color snakes, the way Pastor Abraham says, <laughs> color, color snakes with color, color bites, <laughs> which we all have gone through in our life <laughs> because of our ignorance, because of our uh, shortcomings. We have had some snake biting us <laughs> somewhere, somehow in our life. But then we don't know how it entered and how these snakes came. These color, color snakes. The eagle, amen, has such sharp vision it will capture that snake. Amen. And it will destroy that snake in your life. Amen. What a good God we serve. Thank you, Jesus. So the book of John starts off with Jesus coming from the bosom of the Father. Meaning, Jesus knows how much Father loves him. Because he knows how much Father loves him, he is able to accomplish what Father had planned for him. So the book of John throughout portrays the picture. In John chapter 13, it says, John relies and can always lying, resting on the bosom of Jesus. So book of John is bringing forth the love of God. Throughout the book of John, it talks about the shepherd and the beloved sheep. It talks about father so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, John 3, 16. The book of John brings forward the beauty of Jesus as the son of living God who loved us so dearly and paints the painting of his love in 1st John, 2nd John, 3rd John. When you see the book of John, the, the same apostle, when he wrote the 1st John, chapter 4, verse 18, it says, perfect love casteth out fear. He always brings out love because he knows, John knows how much Father loved him through Jesus. He knows how much Jesus loves him. Because he knows how much Jesus loves him, he is not afraid. John was not afraid. All the apostles were killed, beheaded, imprisoned, except John. We don't know how John died. Because he had no fear of Roman government or Sanhedrin. He had absolutely no fear because he was diving deep in the love of God. Amen, church? Amen? Matthew brings forward the sovereignty of our Lord Jesus. Mark brings forward the servant, service, leadership of our Lord Jesus. Luke brings forward the Son of Man, the Savior to the sinners. John brings forward our son of living God. Matthew showed the face of lion. Mark shows the face of the bull. Luke shows the face of son of man. John shows the face of eagle. Matthew was throughout talking about his majesty. Mark throughout was talking about his ministry. Luke 
throughout was talking about his beauty as a son of man and John throughout was talking about his love his glory as son of living god amen thanks to jesus for this four gospels why god wants you to know this why god wants you to hear and study about this show them second corinthians chapter 3 verse number 18 the more and more you see but we all with unveiled face beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory just as by the spirit of the living God. Why are we studying about four facets? Why we want to know these four faces of Jesus? Why Holy Spirit has written it for us to know? Because the more you see, beholding as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. Could you please repeat after me? The same image, transformed into the same image. When you look into your mirror, you see yourself, right? The ordinary mirror, you see yourself. When you see the law of liberty, the mirror of the book, the Holy Bible, James chapter 2. When you look at this mirror from Genesis to Revelation, the more and more you look at the mirror, beholding, the un beholding with unveiled face, the more and more you behold the unveiled face, you are being transformed as the same image in the mirror. Let me explain. What's the image in the mirror? I just told. What's the, ex what's the image? What's the painting, the portrait that Holy Spirit has painted in the Holy Bible? It is the portrait of the Son of living God. It is the portrait of our Lord Jesus Christ. So the more you look at this portrait, you are being transformed from glory to glory. Amen. Now let me explain. When you see Jesus in the book of Matthew, the majesty of Jesus, the sovereignty of Jesus, you see him as the lion of God. You see him, he's fearless. You see that he is the one who's reigning from the tribe of Judah, the lion of living God. When you see Jesus, you become Jesus. Whatever fears you have, you will be out of all your fears. What is the solution to fear, pastor? How can I overcome fear? Fears of failure, fear of children, fear of future, fear of past. Fear of me past memories, fear of career, fear of money, fear of criticism. How can we overcome these fears? Look at Jesus. Let me give you a beautiful story. You all know Peter walked on the water. When Jesus was walking across the shore, Peter saw that it was Jesus. And what he told, Lord, if it is you bid me to come. He left no option. He said, if it is you. So Jesus had to say, yes, it is me. So you come. He said, if it is you, let me come. Jesus said, come. Now Peter started walking on the water, looking at the face of Jesus. The more Peter looked at the face of Jesus, the fears of the storm, the fears of drowning in the water, the fear of the wind, the fear of the waves, the fear of disciples shouting and telling, what are you doing, Peter? Come in the boat. All the fears left him because he was focusing on the face of Jesus. The more you behold Jesus, you become Jesus. He started to walk on the water like Jesus. Amen. The Bible says, the mystery of the gospel, Colossians 1.27, is that Christ is in you. Christ is in you. You are exactly like Jesus Christ in your spirit. But how can you be like Jesus Christ in your mind, 
in your soul, in your emotions, in your body. How can you be like Jesus Christ? But God's heart for you is that you walk like Jesus on earth. You live like Jesus on earth because he made you his son. You are the son of God. You should know this truth that you are the son of God. You are the beloved of God. The more Jesus is unveiled, the more Jesus is unveiled in the scriptures, you see Jesus and you are transformed into the same image. Wow. You don't have to see the prophets. You don't have to see the laws. Don't see your sins. Don't focus on your addictions. Don't focus on your pain. Don't focus on your problem. Focus on the sun. The more you focus on the sun, S-O-N, the son of living God, you become the son of living God, which you are already. You are already the son of living God. You have to hear that you are son of living God. You have to see that you are son of living God. You have to meditate that you are son of living God. You have to think you are son of living God. You have to speak that you are son of living God. When you see Jesus, speak Jesus, hear Jesus, meditate on the words of Jesus, you become Jesus in your soul and in your body. Amen. As Christ Christ is, so are you here on earth. 1 John chapter 4, verse number 17. Amen. That's the heart of God. God wanted you to see. So when you see the majesty of Jesus in the book of Matthew, you are fearless because Proverbs, it says, the righteous are as bold as lion. When you know you are the righteousness of God, when you know you are the righteous one, then you have no fear of past, no fear of future, no fear of death, no fear of criticism, no fear of your children. You have no fear because you know you are the righteousness. Because all the blessings are for the righteous. The blessings are on the head of righteous. Dear people, if you are in fear, in-house audience, online audience, if you have any kind of fear, know that you are not looking at the face of Jesus, you are looking at wind and the waves. When you look at wind and the waves, what happened? Attention got distracted. He started to drown, right? He went down. So don't take off your eyes from Jesus. That's why the scripture says so beautifully, behold, you should behold Jesus. Let Jesus be always at the backdrop. No matter what you are seeing in your life. Amen. Let Jesus be always at the backdrop. No matter what you are seeing in your life. So when you behold him, you become like him. You are fearless. You are not afraid of your children. You know the Lord takes care. The worst thing that can happen to any individual is death. But in the word for a believer, for a Christian, that's the best thing that can happen. <laughs> You're going to be with the Lord. So don't fear the death of your children, death of your spouse, death of any, anybody in your life. If devil comes with the thought, something is going to happen to your kid, to your spouse, to you, any, any such thought, say, it's okay. Today I'm going to see Jesus. The best thing that can happen to my child, it's okay. It's a short, temporary separation. You must be wondering, how come, pastor, you are talking like this? Yes, you have to renew your mind to the truth. There's nothing, no loophole to devil to put you in the bondage of fear. I know, I know heaven is a real place. Amen not afraid of anything. We are redeemed from death. Amen? Because the righteous are as bold as lion. Amen? When he sees the lion, the faking lion, the one who's roaring like a lion, he will run away like a cat, like a rat in front of you. Amen? 
<laughs> all cat lovers don't be offended what i'm trying to say is <laughs> that you are like a lion amen so it's so important you behold the face of jesus when you behold the face of jesus like a servant what's happening you will not be demanding you will be always giving in a relationship you will not be like what can you do to me well, how you can take care of me how you can provide for me what that person can do to me you say i am having least and zero expectation from anyone i want to be like my jesus i am imitator of jesus who only gives servant leadership amen the more you behold jesus you become jesus when you see the son of man you realize you have authority and you start taking authority in jesus name you will resist the devil because you know you have the authority the more you behold jesus you realize i am not a man i am not a man i am not a man i am the son of living god just like my jesus because the bible says the more you behold jesus you become jesus you realize your son of living god you act like the son of living god you command satan like the son of living god you walk with authority like the son of living god you have to renew your mind to this truth dear people the children of god are living in bondage they are living in slavery to satan god's heart for you is that you are the devil's master sin sickness satan cannot dominate you cannot rule over you god wants you to make the captor into captivity amen amen god wants you to see that so the more and more you see the son of living god you will no longer tell like peter like solomon solomon told right everything under the sun is vanity 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 everything under sun s u n sun when you when you run away from the world, from jesus when you are looking not at the sun when you are not beholding jesus people behold career they are running and running and running after the career people behold a girl or a wife a spouse they are running and running and running after the spouse they behold children running and running running after children they are beholding so many things finally you know what happens they become very tired they like i'm so tired of running and become like solomon vanity 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 <laughs> everything is vanity everything is useless if you don't behold jesus it will become vanity but when you behold jesus it is not a vanity everything has a purpose god has given you people relationships as a steward you are a steward god has trusted you with them and now you will say it is vanity under sun but it is no longer vanity it is full of purpose under son son the son of living god amen so what you see is very important why god wants you to see this one started not in the book of matthew it all started in the book of exodus when adam and eve sinned that time itself god got the uh, ram he sacrificed the ram he brought the ram to them and what he told to adam and eve keep looking at the ram and the blood which they didn't understand then finally in the book of exodus and book of numbers when the people of israel camped in wilderness god gave them a veil god gave them a pattern of tent of meeting now why am i going to exodus for you and for me to understand there are no accidents in the bible everything is planned connecting the new testament to the old testament is i is what i love the most so i want to show you from old testament to the new testament how everything is planned i told you the painting is not started from matthew it was started from genesis so when israelites 
when they came out of slavery what god told keep beholding the sun and he made them to camp around the tabernacle god could not come and live inside man right because of the sin that because sin people had done redemption was not over so god would visit and go back he would come and go back so god told moses make a tabernacle a moving tabernacle in the moving tabernacle he said in the center of the temple for the people to understand to relate the tent of meeting the holy place the church the temple of god will be in the center around the temple where the camps of israel to be camped and inside the temple the tent of meeting there were three partition outer court holy place most holy place the holy place and most holy place was separated by a huge curtain and the curtain had beautiful design i think some of you are not aware of the tabernacle teachings which i have done five years next sunday do not miss i'm teaching on tabernacle next sunday because god has added the numbers and i want you all to relate to every time i quote the old testament tabernacle so tabernacle is outer court holy place and most holy place separated by a veil what is the picture that god gave on the veil can you show them the picture of veil the four faces lion eagle bull son of man it's not taken from google it's copyright of a given generation beautiful designing right <laughs> so beautifully done by our media team so these four faces it does not look like this nobody knows how exactly it looked from the scriptures we have tried to put this together the four faces were in one creature but then we have differentiated for you and for me to understand because if we don't know how to draw that right nobody has seen god tell me people say why don't you keep the picture of god at home or in the church how can we keep the picture of god he has four facets the book of matthew mark luke john brings out lion bull son of man and eagle who has gone to heaven with a dslr camera and got the photo of jesus and we put it here and said this is how jesus looks these are the four works the finished work of our lord jesus that is brought forward that is shown in the four gospels which we see and infer the message of the cross amen so <coughs> the other side is the uh, most holy place this side is the holy place between them is separated by a curtain the four faces where the high priest would stand and do the offering incense we'll get into the details next sunday every time what is the high priest seeing at the backdrop jesus christ amen now in the book of numbers okay show them exodus we'll show them the scriptures of exodus then i'll come to numbers show them the both the scriptures of exodus exodus 26:1 make the tabernacle with 10 curtains of finely twisted linen and blue purple and scarlet yarn with cherubim woven into them by a skilled worker there are meaning for this colors we'll be studying in tabernacle study and all the craftsmen among the workmen made the tabernacle with 10 curtains they were made of fine twisted linen and blue and purple and scarlet yarns with cherubim skillfully worked what are those cherubim those cherubim were the four faces the four faces of jesus here the four when you when you study in deep you understand when you uh, when you go to the hebrew jewish scholars they bring out that these were the four faces that it is talking about the hidden message 
now i told when israelites came god told to camp them around tent of meeting are you all ready to see that picture amen show them the next beautiful picture amen israelite encampment in the wilderness as per the book of numbers numbers 2 2 says the lord called moses and told let israel camp around the tent of meeting in what order in this order <laughs> with the banner the banner that is flag each tribe had a flag so can you see towards the east it was judah isachar zebulun which had the banner of east the lion of judah in the west was ephraim menesa benjamin you remember this is the house of joseph amen that's the house of joseph ephraim menesa benjamin belongs to same mother next north dan asher nephtali we see this side on the south reuben simeon gad in the center was tent of the meeting in the center of tent of the meeting was ark of the covenant which is the picture of our lord jesus god wanted all the four camps of israel to camp exactly around the tabernacle around the tent of the meeting on the east the leader was judah judah isachar and zebulun on the west was the house of joseph that is ephraim menesa benjamin then here on the south we see the reuben the leader he had his banner the reuben was the leader of this tribe so reuben simeon gad and you know each picture had so much of meaning towards each tribe that they represented the promise that jacob spoke on their children amen you remember the first born blessing did not come on reuben the first born blessing actually from reuben it went to the house of ephraim you know why there is so much of man in reuben there was so much of man in reuben what do i mean too much of carnality too many wrongs that reuben has done please go and read the book of genesis you will understand all the notorious wrong things that reuben did too much of man in reuben adamic nature the bible says six is number of man and the beast number is triple six what's the meaning extreme man extreme carnality extreme flesh is triple six so we should not be extreme carnality we should be like the son of living god extreme spirituality that happens the more you behold the son of living god our lord jesus so reuben's picture is son of man which where he lost the blessing thank god it's giving a picture how adam lost the blessing reuben lost the best blessing but jesus took back the blessing pp a commentary <laughs> so the other side of the tribe we see it was led by dan dan has his own blessings i'll not get into that details for this sunday the face of eagle and dan is led by nephtali and asher i mean the tribes together and can you see something beyond the names the color the picture the banner can you all see a hidden diagram in this picture please show that even to our online audience can you all see a hidden picture not the old comers who have heard my message 5 years ago the hidden picture can you see the hidden picture wow yes it is the cross can you see that it is the beautiful cross when you go home and read the entire book of uh, numbers you understand the way god designed the tabernacle and the encampment of israel 
everything is actually pointing out to Jesus. There are no accidents. It is in the beautiful shape of the cross, the hidden message. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Daddy God. Glory to our Lord Jesus. So these were the beautiful banners that they would portray. What was there in the Old Testament in the book of Exodus, in the book of Numbers, we see the vision by Ezekiel. Now Ezekiel still does not understand. He thinks for some reason God is always putting these pictures <laughs> throughout in the veil, in the banner. I don't know what is it about. But now in the New Testament, forgiven generation. Thank God that we are born in the third day. We understand this. Thank God we have the revelation of new covenant. The finished work of the cross of Calvary. These four faces are pointing out to the work of Jesus. So God is giving you a message. Dear people, focus on Jesus. For all the problems, the solution is look at Jesus. It is the same message given to Moses when people were bitten by snakes and they were dying. He said, make a bronze snake, tell them to look at the bronze snake. Throughout Genesis to Revelation, God is telling, look at the sun, look at the sun, look at the sun. Amen. So today, I want to encourage you, all the days of your life, every day, may you always look at the sun of the living God. Shall we all confess together? I will look at the sun. I will look at the sun. Repeat after me. I will look at the sun. I will look at the sun. I will look at the sun only. Behold Jesus. And you become Jesus. Amen. Glory to God. Over to Pastor Abraham. For the Holy Communion. Praise Jesus, church. Are there some blessed people in the house today? Shout an amen. amen. Oh, wonderful. And Pastor Priya, what a feast. What a feast. Looking and listening to the four gospels, four faces of Jesus coming out of four different personalities, from four different angles, four different facets, and your labor in the Word, connecting it from the Old Testament to the New Testament and bringing out Jesus in every scripture, I felt so thoroughly informed. And you know what? Only thoroughly informed people become practically transformed people. Amen. Only thoroughly informed people become practically transformed people. Every time we keep listening to you, we feel so energized because you fill us with the goodness of God. We feel so loaded, and above all, we feel so much loved by God. And one of the best milestones anybody can reach in their spiritual journey is the day they get to know that they are loved by God. That is one of the biggest milestones that you can reach is the day you know it like you know it like you know that you are loved by God. It's a very powerful thing. At least three powerful things take place when you know that you are loved by God. Do you know what's the first powerful thing that takes place when you know you're loved by God? Would you like to give it a try? Wonderful. When the love of God enters, the first powerful thing that happens is the opposite of love exits out of your life. What is the opposite of love? Yes, opposite of love is not hate. 
opposite of love is fear. And the Bible says, those who are afraid, if you are in fear, then love has not been perfected in you. Now, what does that mean? Love has not been perfected in you. Let's read that scripture. Let's put it up. The second slide. The next slide. 1 John 4.18. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear. Because fear involves torment, but he who fears has not been made perfect in love. He who fears has not been perfected in love. No, perfected in love means, you know what? Read the amplified version. Beautiful explanation. So the one who is afraid of God's judgment is not perfected in love. Not perfected in love means he has not grown into a sufficient understanding of God's love. Sufficient understanding of God's love. And perfect love casts out fear. See, sufficient, do you know why people fail? People don't fail because they don't know. It's not that people fail because they don't know. People fail because they don't know enough. Sufficient understanding. We ought to move. From just knowing God is love to God loves me. You have to keep moving. Not just John 3, 16. God so loved the world that he gave. Move. 2 John 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 18. Move, grow sufficiently. Amen. Pastor, is fear that dangerous? That you're telling the first powerful thing that happens is fear exits out of your life when you know God's love. Is fear so dangerous? Yes, sir. Hear me. Fear is not okay. Remember, Jesus and Jairus were headed towards his house. And someone from the ruler's house, they came and they told Jairus, Jairus, your daughter is dead. You remember that story? They came and told Jairus and then they said, Why trouble the master? Leave the master alone. Stop looking at Jesus. That's what he said. Leave the master alone. Why trouble the master? Your daughter is dead. This was spoken to Jairus. But you know who answered? Jesus answered to Jairus. And I want you to see what was the answer Jesus gave. Scripture. While he was still speaking, someone came from the ruler of the synagogue's house saying to him, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher. Why trouble the master? Next. But when Jesus heard it, <coughs> he answered him saying, fear not. Out of all the different things Jesus could have said, he could have said, hold fast to your faith. Be strong in faith, Jairus. But out of all the different things he could have said, the first thing Jesus answered and told Jairus, Jairus, fear not. Fear tolerated is faith contaminated. Fear not. Stop the fear. The problem that is knocking at your door will disappear. Stop the fear. So fear is not okay. So the first thing that happens when God's love enters is that fear exits. And you know what the second powerful thing that happens when God's love enters? Good? There are many things that happen. I'm just talking about the top three. The second powerful thing that happens when God's love enters is that fear exists and faith gets into action. Faith starts taking. The next scripture. 
Galatians chapter 5 verse 6. For in Jesus Christ, neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but faith which works by love. Love-filled faith exists or, or it removes or it casts out all fear. Love-filled faith, not any other faith. But faith, and the third thing, okay, that's the second powerful thing for the lack of time. The third thing, do you know what's the third thing, powerful thing that happens when God's love enters? First is fear exits, faith enters, faith takes, Faith is a superior force. It is a force. Faith is a force. The violent take it by force. The third thing, powerful thing that happens when God's love enters is that obedience becomes easy. Read the scripture. Next scripture. 1 John 2, 5. But whoever keeps his word, whoever obeys his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. Wow. We just heard, we just saw. Who is that who is not perfected in love? The one who is not sufficiently grown in the understanding of God's love. And here we see whoever obeys his word. Truly the love of God is perfected in him. Can you see how important it is to keep filling ourselves with the love of God? Amen? Amen. That's why Apostle Paul said to the Ephesians, read the, last, the next scripture, Ephesians 3.17, quickly, that Christ, can you read it together? <coughs> Hearts through faith, that you being rooted and grounded in love. Next may be able to comprehend with all the saints what is the width and length and depth and height to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. This was the most important prayer of Apostle Paul that you understand. Be filled with the goodness of God. Amen. Because these three powerful things take place. So keep filling. Can you say with me? Keep filling. Keep filling. Keep filling. If there is somebody here this morning, you say, Pastor, I'm going through tough times right now. Things are just getting delayed. I don't know what to do. I'm feeling lonely have nothing to do, I'm so tensed. Just do only one thing that Jesus told us to do. Because only one thing is needed. What is the one thing needed? That you sit at his feet and keep filling. Keep on filling. By the way, was that not the first secret that Jesus revealed when he performed the first miracle. What was the first miracle that Jesus performed? Water turned into wine. Wonderful. The first miracle Jesus performed was at the wedding at Cana. Mary, Mother Mary looked at Jesus and said, they are running out of wine. In other words, what she was saying is, they are about to approach shame and reproach and disappointment. They are about to experience a major shame and problem in their life. What did Mary tell the servants? The first one? See the scripture. His mother said to the servants, do whatever he tells you. Now, what was the solution that Jesus gave to this problem? A problem which is going to lead them to shame, disappointment, so you can put in whatever problem that you have. What was the solution that Jesus gave? Jesus said to the servants, John 2, next slide. 
Yes. Jesus said to the servants, fill the jars with water. You remember that story? He said, fill the jars with water. Now, what does the jar represent? 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 7. Verse 4, verse 7. Wonderful. We have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this all-surpassing power is, not, is from God and not from us. What does the jar represent? It represents we. It represents us. The physical body. We have the treasure. Christ is in us. The jar represents us. What does the water represent? Ephesians 5.26 likens the word of God as water. The reference scripture is here. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. So the jar represents us, the physical body. Water represents the word of God. And Jesus said, fill the jars with water. And how did they fill? Can we see that one scripture? John 2, 7. John 2, 7. You know how did they fill? They filled it to the brim. Mm, very important. They filled it to the brim. See, it's not about just doing it. But you must do it fully. It's not just about doing it partially. Whatever he says to do, do it fully. And when did the water turn into wine? After they filled it to the brim, did Jesus say, now I will lay my hands and pray? No. When they filled it to the brim, Jesus just said, draw some of it and go give it to the master of the banquet. The water had turned into wine. What turned the water into wine? It was their mere obedience. Or doing it, filling it to the brim. Are you getting what I'm saying, church? Let me ask this one last question. How valuable is dust? How valuable is dust? No one, absolutely nothing, right? No one goes in search of dust. Matter of fact, even if your shoes gather some dust, you wipe it off. That's how worthless it is. It tells you how valueless it is. And still, God, God brought something worthwhile out of a worthless thing. I saw something very powerful in Genesis chapter 2 and verse 7. Please read it for yourself. Genesis chapter 2 and verse number 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life and man became a living soul. Church, please notice what turned an ordinary dust into a living soul. When God formed man of the dust, after that, God did not fold his hands. If God would have folded his hands, Adam would have just looked like this. Absolutely no life, no joy, no excitement. As good as, as good as dead. But the moment God breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, the Ruah of God. Adam became a living soul. Can you see what transformed an ordinary dust into a living soul? 
It was the breath of life, the word of God. Amen. Like God, we also form a lot of things and start many things. We form a lot of things by filling many forms. We form an organization, we form a business, and we start many things. We start married life, we start a business, we start an organization, we start career. We form many things, but you know what you and I are doing? The biggest mistake, what you and I do? After forming it, we fold our hands. And we think now it will work. No, sir. It will be as good as a dead Adam. There are many dead marriages today. Although still both parties are staying together. They have started married life. They formed. And they started. But there are many dead marriages. But as soon as the breath of God enters into your married life just like how Adam became a living soul your marriage will become a living marriage amen, amen. we form so many things and we there are many dead bank accounts business is happening customers are coming every day they're coming and going but balance is not increasing but the moment the breath of God enters into your financial planning, it will become a live, active bank account. Amen. Fill it to the brim. Amen. The word of God. The love of God. Fill it with God's goodness. And see it transform in your life. Amen, church. Are you getting what I'm saying? That's why it's so important that you keep listening and keep filling yourself and do it fully. Fully when it comes to your health, do it fully. When it comes to your planning, do it fully according to the word of God. Obey it fully and see the water turn into wine. Amen.